Amen. He is great. Amen. And don't we have a great music team every Sunday? Let's give them a praise the Lord too. Praise the Lord. We're so grateful for all that God's done. Well, there was a very enthusiastic preacher that started his sermon off at a local church and he told his congregation, he said, listen, people, we are just going to have to quit sitting around at church and we're going to have to start walking for the Lord. And part of the congregation got into it and said, let her walk, brother, let her walk. He said, but we're not going to have to stop at walking. We're going to have to pick up the pace for Jesus and start jogging. And man, the people con congregation said, let her jog, brother, let her jog. He said, listen, we can't stop at jogging. We're going to have to run for Jesus. We're going to have to run with all our might. And boy, the congregation chimed in. Let her run, brother, let her run. And in order to run, congregation, we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to be more committed. We're going to have to be more for faithful. We're going to have to serve even harder. Congregation yelled out, let her walk, brother, let her walk. <laughs> you know, that's about it, isn't it? We can holler, but everything that we need to do for Jesus is going to take more faithfulness and more sacrifice and more running. And so this morning, the name of the title of the message is Run the Weight Race and Don't Quit. Apropos that today is Marathon Sunday for the race, and so we're going to be talking about a race, but a little different race, the race for the Lord. And Hebrews lets us know that we are in a race for Jesus. And so we'll look at a few things that tell us what runners and Christians do are similar. We're going to be looking at those two, four things that runners and Christians and races need to do. And that's liking, liken, lay aside, look, and learn. And let's look at each of these in this passage. We'll be covering selected verses out of Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 11, we won't hit every verse in there, but we'll hit most of them. First thing is, is to liken yourself to the heroes. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we have, have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. I know growing up, the pastors would preach this, that that meant that there's a lot of people up in heaven looking down at us, cheering us on that that's how we're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. But that's not what that is. That that doesn't fit into the context of the scripture. We just got through reading Hebrews chapter 11, which are the heroes of the faith. And that's what he's talking about, that we have witnesses that have gone before us who are our heroes, the people that we need to make our lives like their lives. We have great witnesses. They witness these people in the Old Testament live a life that was pleasing. They witnessed Daniel not saying no and getting thrown in the lion's den. Uh, they witnessed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying no to the world and yes to Jesus and get thrown in the fiery furnace. And They witnessed all kind of great things of men and women of faith who stood on the principles of God's word at whatever the cost. Those are our heroes. You know, today the our heroes are not the heroes that we should have. I mean, we got sports heroes and that might be fine and dandy. We may have entertainment heroes, but we need to have biblical heroes. You know, just cause somebody can throw a ball into a round hoop doesn't necessarily mean that they're a hero. You know, they may be, they may walk with Christ, but just cause you can play a sport or do an entertainment or do or sing a song doesn't make you a hero. What makes you a hero is when you have the courage and the backbone and the stamina to stand for God in a wicked and ungodly world. That's a hero. Somebody that we can look up to and say, I want to be like them. Well, we've got plenty of examples of that. Look in the Old Testament, look in the New Testament, people that we can say, you know what? I've got some witnesses. I can look and I can act like them. But those witnesses shouldn't stop back then. They ought to be living today. There's people around me that I've seen and say, you know, I want to be more like them. Uh, I want to have faith like them. I want to witness like them. I want to be more like them. And all of us even today have people that are our witnesses that we look around us, and obviously we mainly look at Jesus. That's the, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. 
But we not only should look at other people that are our mentors, we should be mentors. People should be looking at us and say, you know, I want to be more like them in that area because they're just like Jesus. Because that's really what you want shared at your funeral is that people wanted to be like you because you were like Jesus. You were a witness to somebody else. You were somebody else's in, in, inspiration. You see, we all need motivation. It's in our DNA. You say, but Brother Tim, some people are self-motivated. I know, they still need motivation. They're just doing it themselves, right? We all need motivation. And Paul's saying our motivation in this race is looking at all the people who have run the race and have done it successfully and done it for Christ and maybe they're already dead and gone but their testimony still lives on. Isn't that what you, what you want of your life? Is for your testimony to live on to say, man, they live for Christ. They were a great witness, witness of the faith. They were a great testimony to those around us. You know the old saying, you know, if you're arrested for being, being Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> In a courtroom, would you be able to call enough witnesses to say, witnesses on my behalf because I was arrested for being a Christian and I need some people to speak on my behalf? Well, here, these are the examples that we are set before us. And then the next one is lay aside all hindrances. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If you're going to be a runner in a race, if you're going to be a runner in the Christian life, you're going to have to start saying no to some stuff, just like runners do. You know, first of all, runners get the encumbrances out. That word encumbrances has to do with weights. First of all, they get their own weight down. If they weigh too much, then they start losing weight. It, and they don't take things out on the track when they're ready to race. You never see any runner out there with a suitcase, six pack of Dr. Pepper, you know, a big old watch, big necklace, you know, with big weight on it. You know, they don't want anything to weigh them down. They want the lightest clothing, the lightest tennis shoes, so that they don't have any extra weight because they have a goal in mind, and that's to win this race. Paul's saying, do you have any encumbrances on your little race for Jesus, your race to the finish line in this Christian race? Do you have anything that encumbers you? The reason we do is we don't take Christian race as importantly as we do if we're running a real race. And when I say real, I mean a running race. Paul's saying we need to get rid of all that. Get rid of anything that would weigh us down. And you know what that is. You know the things that weigh you down. You know the things that keep you from being all God wants you to be. It may be your hobby. It may be your time schedule. It may be your priorities. It may be things that you have placed in place of the Lord. You know what they are. You're not fooling Jesus by saying, you know, there are some things that I need to get out of my life so I can run better that have encumbered me, have weighted me down, and I'm not as faithful as I should, and so I've got some things to get this weight out of my life. Then he says, in the, th the sin which so easily entangles us. If you've got any sin in your life, that's like wearing a long gown during a marathon race, you know, or wearing long, you don't want, or you're having your shoelaces untied. You don't want anything to trip you up. So get away anything in your life as a runner that'll trip you up. And the scripture says here, it's the sin which so easily entangles us and trips us up. If you've got a sin that you just won't get rid of, whether it's a sin of what you're doing or what you're not doing, you need to get that out of your life because that trips you up. And what runner would get out on the track with anything that's going to trip up his feet. And sin is what does that with us. George Sweeting was on vacation in Niagara Falls. And he said as he was watching the waterfall there, he said he noticed it was in the time of 
the season where the ice had broken out from uh, upstream. And as the ice was floating down, these seagulls would spot fish that were frozen in the ice. So they would land on the ice, have a good little boat ride, and they could chip down and eat the fish that was in the frozen ice as they were making their way down to the fall. And then probably about two feet before the fall, they would fly off and then the rest of the iced fish would go over the waterfall. And as he noticed that, he noticed one particular seagull had got on his fish way, way upstream. And boy, he was sure enjoying his free meal. And as he was making his way down, eating that fish, he noticed that this seagull started to flap his wings like the others about two or three feet before the falls. However, he had been on that block of ice so long. I say he'd been on that block of ice so long. I don't think you're hearing me. He had been on that block of ice so long that his little feet, he has feet, claws, uh, got edge of the, the waterfall and so he started doing his little flapper. Well, his little flap in the wings didn't work because he'd been on that block of ice way too long. And he went down to his death because he had been eating on that stuff that tasted so good, so long. And he wasn't going to hear no preacher talk about it. He wasn't going to hear no Bible talk about it. This is good stuff and nobody's going to tell me this isn't good stuff for me. It may be not be good stuff for anybody else, but it's good stuff for me and nobody's going to tell me not to eat this. And you be on that long enough, that brings you to your spiritual downfall. That's what will entangle us in our spiritual race is the thing that entangles us, the sin that entangles us. We complain, but if God says get rid of it, it's best to get rid of it. Because one day you may be saying, I think I'll get a bit rid of it right now. And you've held on to it so long, it just becomes a habit of life, a justification. And then he says, run with endurance. Don't quit. You know, sometime, like with any race, even the Christian race, there's times when we want to quit. We want to quit church. We want to quit lift. We want to quit praying. We want to quit reading my Bible. We want to quit being faithful. We want to quit sacrificing. We want to quit serving. We want to quit ministering to others. All of us, there's time we just want to quit. <laughs> I'm tired. Let somebody else do this. But if you're going to run this race, you got to run it already predetermined. I'm going to finish this bad boy. I'm going to endure. With God's help and God's endurance that he gives me, I'm going to endure to finish this race. I am not going to quit. The dad was trying to teach his boy that deal. That deal. He said, son, you quit everything. You start this sport and you quit it. And you start this and you quit it. And you start this project and you quit it. You just don't finish anything. He said, son, I mean, remember... Thomas Edison, he didn't quit. Remember Abraham Lincoln, he didn't quit. Remember there's old uh, Ernest Baumgarten. And the son said, well, I never heard of Ernest Baumgarten. I know, he quit. <laughs> Nobody remembers quitters. Nobody's going to remember you when you die at your funeral that you quit. Oh, they were a good Christian quitter. They just quit. No, they're going to remember you for one thing. You were faithful. You were a faithful runner. The day you got saved, you got on those tracks and you may, have ju you may have messed up, you may have fell down, but you got up every time and you got back to a faithful run for Jesus. Don't quit. Endure. The third thing that runners and Christians need to do is to look to the finish line. Fixing your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, we've got to get our eyes, first of all, fixed on our perfect example, which is Jesus. He's the one who is the starter, the perfecter of the faith that we have in him. We get our eyes on Jesus. If you're a runner, you've got to put your eyes straight forward. You can't look back. You can't look on the side. You've got to keep your eyes focused on what's ahead. And what's ahead is Jesus. The question is, how did Jesus endure? How did Jesus endure the cross? It says right there. You don't have to ask me. How did he do it? For the joy set before him, 
he endured the cross. So even he looked at what was ahead of him. He didn't, he wasn't focused on the cross. It says here, he was looking at the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? One that he would be back with the Father, he'd be back at the right hand of the throne of God, and that all of us would have an avenue by which we would be able to get to heaven through him. And that we would be reunited through him, through the cross, and men would not be lost and going to hell, they'd be coming to heaven by receiving him as their savior and be in eternal glory with him for the rest, <clears throat> excuse me, for the rest of their life. That's what he set his eyes on. Us. Me. Personally. You. Personally. He was setting that on us. The joy that would be his for us to have salvation with him. The people knew they'd been to these Isthmian games in Greece. These Bibles written in Greek. In these Greek games, these Olympic games, in the running portions of the games, they would put a pedestal down at the end, the finish line. And sitting on that pedestal was the prize. Whether it was a trophy, the reef, or whatever it was, the prize was set up in these Greek games back then at the, at the finish line. So as you were getting on your mark, get set, you said, I want that. I want that right down there. I ain't gonna look at the runners. I'm going to look at that. These runners may disappoint me. What's behind me may disappoint me. But I got my eyes on that prize. And I'm going to do all I can to get it. That's what Olympic runners do today. Don't you love that part of the Olympics where they get the gold medal and national anthem and all that? I like that part. I don't like that exercise and preparation Special diet, no sweets, no desserts. I don't like that part. But I'd sure like that, doing like that and getting that medal. But that's why that's never going to happen with Tim Strickland. You'll never, you'll never see that. I'll never experience that. Because... Well, first of all, it's too late. But I would have never wanted to sacrifice that much to get that. And that's what a lot of Christians do. You know, they say, you know, do I really want to hear those words? Well done. Thy good and hit and miss servant. I mean, faithful servant. That's what he's going to say. Or that's what you want him to say. That's what I want. That's what I want. And you've got to keep your eyes on that. You've got to keep your eyes on what's ahead. You see, that's what you do for work in the mornings. Some days you think, oh, God, that alarm, I want to shoot it with my gun. It can't be that time already. And you get up anyway, and you go to work. And guess what? Sometimes you wake up and you hear it raining. You know where I'm going with this. And you say, you, you may say, oh, it's raining. I'm going to stay in bed. No, it's raining. I'm going to get up and go anyway. That's novel. I'm tired. I'm a little sick. And you get up anyway. Do you know why you do that? Reward. You've set your eyes on the paycheck. You say, I like that paycheck. First and 15th, I like that paycheck. Because you know if you don't get up often enough, your employer's going to say this, no more paycheck. Here's a little pink sheet of paper, but no more paycheck. No more reward. And so you get up. Oh, but that isn't how church goes. I think I heard two drops of rain. You can't go to church with two drops of rain. Everybody knows that. That's in, the, that's in the policy book. Tired. That's in the... But see, that's, it, you do it. Why do you do work like that and not church like that? One word, reward. 
If it wasn't for that paycheck, if they didn't pay you, you'd probably say, well, since they don't pay me anyway, why should I even get up? But reward is even in God's handbook. And we need to set our mind on that. And then it even adds in verse 3, for consider him, Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. He had every reason to give up. I mean, even people mocked him why he's doing it. I mean, just constantly against him. So that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Don't give up. You see, by, Paul, by the writer of Hebrews writing this, sometimes we get weary and we just want to lose heart. We just want to quit, whether quit a ministry or quit serving or quit being faithful, but don't lose heart. And you and me, we've not resisted to the point of shedding blood in our striving against sin. Has anybody had to shed blood for Jesus? I don't, you didn't come up here on a work day and you hit your nail with a hammer. I ain't what we talking about. We're saying that have you had to be beaten and shed your blood? No, we've never sacrificed that much, at least not here in America. So we can keep on keeping on for Jesus. We don't have to give up. We can be faithful. And then the last one is learn to respond light, rightly to discipline. Learn to respond rightly to discipline. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. You wouldn't think the word exhortation, which means encouragement, and the word discipline would be in the same sentence. But it is. From verse 4 to verse 11, the word discipline is mentioned nine times in eight verses. That's a lot of time to say the word discipline. Some of your versions may say chastening. It has to do with training. Because runners and Christians not only need to keep their eye focused, get rid of all the extra weight and excess, but they're also, and look at the finish line, they also need to experience discipline to be a good runner. It's the same way for the Christian. He needs to be disciplined sometime by the Lord, which sometime comes in the form of suffering or circumstances or difficulties that the Lord may send our way for a reason, for us to be trained. This little secret. The Lord also has some strong-willed children. I don't think you heard that. The Lord does have some strong-willed children. See, there's been some authors here in America that's written books called The Strong-Willed Child. God said he has some of the people on his list like that too. Very strong-willed. Say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I know what the Bible says, but... Okay. Well, if you really do know the Lord, then discipline is in store because God disciplines his children. That's, he trains them. He corrects them. He rebukes them in various ways. Why? So they can be a better runner. And that's what runners do. They go through discipline so they can be a better, faster runner in the race. And that's why it's an exhortation. A couple of things about discipline. First of all, discipline is motivated by love. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. I know I, when I discipline my children, sometimes I'd have to say, look, I'm doing this because I love you. Of course, you may have responded by saying, well, don't love me quite so much. <laughs> Maybe telling the Lord, don't love me this much. There's just been a whole lot of discipline in my life. Uh, uh, love me a little less. Well, you hadn't done what he's asked you to do first. See, a parent only disciplines until the behavior changes. And they don't continue disciplining. I mean, your goal is just to correct the behavior. Because remember this, discipline is different from punishment. <clears throat> a lot of people say, Brother Tim, I guess the Lord's just punishing me for this. 
I'll correct them quickly. The Lord doesn't punish you for anything. That's what he did to Jesus. He poured out the wrath of punishment for all of our sins and laid it all on Jesus at the cross. I mean, that's why it was such a terrible, agonizing, suffering death because he poured out the sin of the world on his son. God doesn't punish you. He's already punished Jesus for you. Jesus took your and my place on the cross for punishment. This is discipline. This is what a good parent does for a son or daughter so that they'll be who they're supposed to be. But once he corrects the behavior, so I let people know, no, God's not punishing you. God may be disciplining you. Just change the misbehavior. And then some of the discipline may cease in that regard. So it's done out of love. Second thing about discipline is it proves relationship. But if you are without discipline, then he goes on to say, then you are illegitimate children, not sons. A lot of people will say, man, I'm doing all this and living how I want to and there's nothing. God had not done anything. Praise the Lord. No, not praise the Lord. Oh, Lord. Because according to the scripture, that proves one thing clearly. You are not a Christian. You are not his son. You're illegitimate and you will not go to heaven because only his sons go to heaven. It says it clear here. If you're without it, you're illegitimate. So if I do what I want to do, and there's no discipline. There's no sonship. See, I don't discipline other people's children. I discipline my own children. And God does too. He disciplines his own kids. For me, pretty much, I'm on a short leash. A lot of people say, well, I get, I get away with a lot with the Lord. He hadn't done anything. I would check my salvation and say, Lord, I... I'm, I need to be your child. I don't mean go out deliberately and do something sinful to see if you get spanked. <laughs> There's plenty of opportunities for the Lord to discipline us for us to see even in our own realm. And also discipline is designed for our good. He disciplines us for our good. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. Amen. Nobody likes it. Don't, you're never going to get to the point and say, man, I'm just so glad these this sorrowful times are coming upon me. Nobody likes that. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterward, it yields the, pre, pre, the, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. In the end, it's good stuff. If you let it train you. If you let it train you. Did you go through the last difficulty, the last trial, the last hardship with anything that produced anything righteous or godly or that changed your behavior for the kingdom of God? No, but I got through it, Brother Tim. Praise the Lord. So no change? God didn't do a work in you of any way? No, but I got through it. Praise the Lord. Well, if his reason may be sending it to you, it was to be able to change some things in you, then you didn't learn in it what he wanted you to learn in it. No, but I got through it. Well, you may need to go through what I call spiritual summer school. If you didn't get it during the regular season, then the school sends you to summer school to get it. And if God didn't teach it to me this way, then maybe I need to go through another one so that I'll get it. If the reason he sent me through it was to change me and make me more like him. You've heard me tell the story about the man that looked out his window and saw the cocoon and saw the butterfly wanting to break open and have life. And he saw the crack and he saw the little cocoon. He felt sorry for it. Didn't seem like that thing was cracking open fast enough. So he raised his window and took his finger and broke open the cocoon and noticed that the little butterfly never moved much and obviously his wings didn't begin to grow and he just, even when he left for vacation, it was still laying there like that. Then he read where the way God created it, 
was so that that butterfly would be pressing up against that cocoon and and by pressing he would allow the pressure to allow the juices and the blood to make its way down to the ends of the wings and pressing this one would allow the blood and the juices and the fluid to be able to go down to this wing so that naturally through the suffering and through the agony and through the pain he would be able to come out with those beautiful wings and be able to fly. And what the man had done was hinder that because that butterfly needed to accomplish a change while under the pressure. And that change would be beneficial for him and be able to be what God called that animal to be. And beauty, inside, and abilities, outside. The hardships, because the same sun that melts the snow hardens the clay. People will go through a difficulty and be either melted or hardened in their walk. Then we close out with this one. The discipline accomplishing three basic goals. What are the three basic? And of course you could have two sermons just on this, but there's three basic things that discipline in the, in the Christian runner seeks to you know, first of all, it's to get our attention. I find out that it's not that most Christians don't know what to do. They just don't do it. And you think, I know I'm not doing it. So, well, sometimes God will send a discipline, a hardship, a difficulty to be able to say, I don't have your attention. I've told you what to do. You've heard it preached. You've heard it read. You've heard it emphasized, but you're not doing it. And he tried to just get our attention with the Word, with the Holy Spirit, with a nudge, and we still wouldn't give him our attention to say, yes, Lord, what, do you, what is it you want to do? I'm going to do it. And God says, I have other methods to get your attention, and I'll use them. You've heard about maybe the owner he, owner, he owned a company of 50 employees and this owner had one goal every year at Christmas time is for all 50 of his employees to give to the orphan fund so that the company could give presents to the local orphanage. Well, he asked his manager, the owner did, said, well, how are we looking? He said, we've got one employee holding out. He said, bring him to my office. He said, well, have you told him about the, yeah, I've explained it to him and he still won't give? No, we'll bring him to my office. So he set him down in his office and said, look, as the owner of this company, I have one project every year. It's the orphan fund. And said, uh, I always, my goal is 100%. And said, you're the only employee of the 50 that hadn't given. He said, I will have 100% participation and I, I can accomplish it two ways. First of all, I can fire you and I've got 100% participation. <laughs> or you can give toward this orphanage fund. So the guy he studied and thought a while. And he got out his wallet and put the money up there. And the owner said, well, what changed your mind? He said, I really never had it explained that well before. <laughs> <laughs> See, maybe you haven't had God explain it that well before until he touches you. There's a suffering. There's a hardship. There's a difficulty. And God says, give me your attention. And you may say, Lord, I never had it explained to me that way before. We've got to have, God has to have our attention. And sometimes through discipline, he gets it. Second of all, he wants to allow the discipline to make us more like Jesus and more dependent on him. Matter of fact, that verse is in there so that we may share in his holiness. Maybe there's just something, you know, that's in our life that just won't come out. And when we go through the discipline, we come out more like Jesus. You say, you know what, I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of being this way. And now that I've been through this difficulty, it's time to let this go, to let this sin go. And it goes during that time. I know if you've been like me, I've been through some hardships, Lord, and you try to get everything out because you don't know why you're going through this hardship, but you want to check off that it's not this. <laughs> 
I'm not saying all hardship may be, being, but I always check it out. And if I'm going through hardships, I want to say, okay, this is out. You got my attention. I've got rid of the, I want to make sure that it's not continuing because of that. And if I get rid of that, and I know there's some other purpose he's seeking to do. Now you can do it however you want. That's what I do because I'd like it to stop as soon as possible. <laughs> and I want to make sure that I'm not the reason for it to not stop. And we need to be dependent on him. See, in this nation, even the poorest, we have all these blessings. And it's hard many times for Americans to be dependent on God in good times and in bad. But when you go through difficulty, you find that out. I don't know, but our church and almost most churches in America had one of their highest attendances on September the 16th, 2001. And if you know what September the 16th, 2001 was, that was the Sunday after 9-11. Second Baptist Church Houston said we had more people in our church than we've ever had in the history of the church. And if you were here at Believer's Fellowship, we had a ton of people too. And us and other churches didn't have a ton of people a few weeks later. Though. See, everybody was dependent on God. Is this going to be part of life in America? These bombs going to be going off all over? We need God. And everything settle down and say, thank you, God, we don't need you anymore because the bombs have stopped. And we got life going pretty good without you. And church attendance plummeted back and now it's back where it was. We need to be dependent on a holy God every day of our life, every breath that we take. And if we're not dependent on God, then God says, well, this trial will make you dependent. Now, during the trial, you get dependent on God and said, God, help me. You just need to make sure, and I need to make sure after that trial, we're more dependent, more faithful, more reliable, more on fire for God. Because if we get out the other side and said, God, thank you for helping me during that deal, but now I got it on my own, we may need another trial. Because it seems like during trials only is when we're committed to the Lord. So that's one. And then the third basic one is this. It makes us more useful for the kingdom. More useful for God's kingdom. Are you? Am I? Did what I went through make me a better minister? Because if God ministered to you through people or through him, it should make us come through the other side saying, God, use me to help other people. I've heard me say before, the farmer was nailing up a sign and the sign said, puppies for sale. As soon as he nailed it up, he felt a tug on his pants. He looked down, there was a little boy down there saying, Sir, you selling puppies? He said, I sure am. He said, these are some of the most expensive dogs in this county. He said, they're from a pure bloodline with champions in that bloodline. He said, they're very expensive animals. So a little boy reached down his pocket and he had 42 cents. He said, is that enough to buy one? And the farmer about cried. He said, yeah, son, that, that's, that's just about what they're selling for. And so the farmer whistled and out come a mama dog and about six of her puppies and they're running and they're jumping on the little boy and they're licking him and everything said, son, just pick you out one and it's yours. And so he looked and before he was able to pick out one, he saw something moving in the dog house and he looked down there and there was one more coming out and it was crippled, crippled both his legs. Took it a long time to get to the boy. And the boy said, what's wrong with that one? said, he's crippled. He was born that way, crippled. He said, he'll be crippled the rest of his life. And the little boy said, uh, I'll take that one. He said, son, that dog's never going to be able to play with you, never going to be able to run with you, never going to be able to do all the things that a little boy needs. And the little boy reached over and raised both his pants legs up. The farmer saw the braces saw the special shoes, all the wire and devices on his little legs. And then the little boy said this, Sir, I don't run very well either. 
And that dog's really going to need somebody to understand him. See, if you're going through difficulty, and I'm going through difficulty, there's other people going through difficulty too, just like you went through. And God wants us to go through that situation and say, bless God, I'm going to church because there's people there that need me. And he sent me through this difficulty. Maybe not number one, maybe not reason number two, but I know at least he did it for number three. I'm going to help other people. I'm going to be plugged in enough to a church where I'm going to find out who's hurting and I'm going to be able to help them because God helped me and I know what those people are feeling like. Bless God and the Lamb. That's part of the church. That's part of what the church does. That's where we get the encouragement, the help that we need. Don't be fussing at God. God said, I'm putting the answer in the church. There'll be people there if you're plugged in enough to know people well enough to know who you need to minister to, who you need to encourage, who you need to help, and they need to help you. I think many people get to heaven and say, God, where were you? And said, I was in the church. I had people there to minister to you, love you, help you, give to you. Your answer was there. And that's part of the reason God also sends us these situations. I like what Francis Chan quotes. He said, our greatest fear should not be our failures. Our greatest fear should be the successes in our life that really don't matter. Our fear shouldn't be the failures in life. Our fear ought to be our life's successes that really don't matter in life. That's what we ought to fear. Because God had you and I born on the day that we were born so that we'd come to know Him as Lord and Savior one day and had a particular reason and purpose for our life that by the time we were born to the time we die, we'd fulfill that purpose for somehow doing something to build up the kingdom of God. For God's kingdom. And we need to know that when I finish that race, however long that race is, the finish line is at different lengths for different people. Some it's the day they were born, they died. Some at age five, some at age 10, some 50, some 70, some 100. But whenever I finish that race, whenever you finish your race, we have to be able to say one thing. Did I finish the work that God called me to do for his kingdom? And if he did, I finished well. That's it. Yeah, but my life's about retirement and about having possessions. Well, those are all going to stay behind, and you're, that's all that mattered here. What matters is what, how I finish for Christ at the finish line because almost all of my life will occur after death. And almost, not almost, almost completely all of our lives is after death. We only live about 100 years or less here. Over there it's trillions and zillions and eternity without end. Run the race. Don't quit. Don't go weary. We're all in this race together if we know Christ. Stand to your feet as we pray and as the music team comes.